All right. Well, yep. let's jump into it. Hello, welcome back to Black Doctors Podcast. I am Steven, your host. So excited to be joining you for yet another episode of the show. I am privileged to have Dr. Candace Hughes. She is a fellow alumnus of the Howard University College of Medicine. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Glad to be here. So Dr. Hughes, uh, she is a product through and through of HBCUs. She attended FAMU for undergrad before finishing the medical school at Howard. And then she completed a family medicine residency in uh, Columbus, Ohio, before uh, going on to, to practice. So we're excited to hear Correct. about family medicine, what you've done um, in your practice, and then this new practice model you've engaged in involving skilled nursing facilities. So we're going to learn so much from you about the business of medicine and how you can truly find your niche. Yeah, yeah. Just like, just as a background. So yeah, like you said, I went to FAMU for undergrad, uh, matriculated how, through... how, how was, we, we oh. can't breeze through <laughs> FAMU because I, okay. I mean, I know That's you got fair. some stories. Tallahassee. Um, <laughs> yeah. That, uh, fam, no, family, FAMU family was show, awesome. family show. Right, right, right. No, no uh, FAMU was awesome. Um, I actually, I was there during the Humphreys era, era. So if anybody knows about FAMU, they know about the Humphreys era. So I went on a full scholarship. Actually, Dr. Humphreys, the president at the time, was going around with the band as they were playing mm. other uh, HBCU, as the football team was playing other HBCUs. And he was basically doing an Oprah, like handing out scholarships. Like, you get a scholarship, you get a scholarship for uh, really? the National Merit semifinalist. So yeah, I actually went to FAMU on a full ride, which was, I mean, such a blessing. And I had a fantastic time. <laughs> and, and, and that was the Humphreys era? The Humphreys era, yes. So anybody who's familiar with FAMU knows about the Humphreys era. What, what yeah. else was it? There's, was it there, scholarships? There, and... <laughs> um, there may have been a little bit of controversy, but no, it was a big period of recruiting <laughs> for the school. That was mm -hmm. when we were consistently um, number one public university in the U.S. News and World Report. So we were doing, FAMU was doing a lot of big things at the time, like President Humphreys for all of the you know, the other things, he he really sought to make a name for the school and to really establish FAMU as not just a premier HBCU, but as a premier university in the nation. So nice. Yeah. So so then, you know, I went from there to Howard. I mean, you know, you go from there to the Mecca like that. It, <laughs> it doesn't get any better than that. Now, um, so, and, so what you did know, you study a, yeah. at, at FAMU to set you up to go into medical school? I was a, I was a biology major, kind of your typical bio pre-med, um, minor in chemistry. Although I always say if I had to do it again, I'd probably major in English because that was, I would have okay. been better. I would have had a higher GPA. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, got to Howard and that was such an amazing experience. I mean, for me growing up here in Norfolk and I mean, you, you know, you've spent a lot of time in Hampton Roads. Oh, yeah. It's very... Um, it's very black and white. And so being exposed to, you know, not just other black people like African Americans, you know, ADOS, but black people from all over the diaspora. That was that was new for me because even at FAM we didn't have a lot of international students. If we did, they were mainly from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, but at Howard, I definitely got to meet and interact with a lot more international students. And so that, you know, kind of opened up my world. And of course, having attendings and mentors that, you know, looked like me, that I can't under overstate how important that was. I mean, that's even the reason I was able to get into residency, which is a whole other story. But yeah, yeah. having somebody that looked like you go to bat for you. So... Because I've heard this from other people that go to HBCUs and then go to Howard. Usually there, there ends up being a couple of y'all that end up in the class. Did you have a cohort or a, a tribe when you got to Howard? Um, yes. Yeah, so actually one of my very good friends from FAMU was in my matriculating class. He's an orthopedic surgeon now. And then behind me in a couple of classes, which actually you probably know a few of these people um, <laughs> who came from FAMU and went yeah. through Howard. So definitely, yeah, there's definitely a pipeline. I mean, you think about it, Howard, Meharry Morehouse. I mean, you know, where else are you going to go as a Black um, pre-med or as a Black med student? Where else are you going to go to really get that experience? 
Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I mean, and we can talk all day about how amazing Howard was, but for yeah. you guys that are out there, <laughs> yeah, if you're yeah. looking at medical schools, maybe you're at an HBCU or maybe you're not. I mean, one, the HBCUs, like you, you typically find some of your folks when you get to Howard. And if not, you're going to find mm-hmm. some folks. And if you've ever, you know, mm-hmm. you're at a PWI, you're going to get a whole experience along with medical school. So highly yeah. recommend it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Um, So, yeah, I would definitely say that, you know, that set me up because then going to residency in Columbus, Ohio, and although, you know, Columbus is a major metropolitan, still, I was in my class, we started off, there were four Black residents, and then, and this is, we had a pretty large class, so we had a class of 13, which for family medicine programs is pretty large, So there were four Black residents that started with me. And then at the end of our intern year, there were only three. And it was three women. And after us, there was one Black resident in the class behind us. And then the class behind them, the interns when I was a senior resident, they did not have any Black residents. Mm. So, you know, so having come from this really you know, nurturing environment where everybody looked like me to truly being a minority. That that was a shock, but I'm glad that I had that experience because it gave me the confidence that I needed to go out and, <clears throat> you know, to experience residency and all of that, <laughs> all of that yeah. trauma, you know, but be able to navigate it. So... So yeah, then residency came back home to Virginia, and I actually started out in full spectrum family medicine, uh, birth okay. to death. So I started out working for one of the larger hospital organizations here, in an outpatient clinic, seeing like twenty seven to thirty patients a day, and Oof. I absolutely hated it. <laughs> I I hated it. It was very churn and burn. It was fee for service. So it's, you know, you see as many, you get the RVUs and, you know, that's it. And it wasn't practicing medicine the way that I wanted it. I wanted to practice medicine. One of the reasons that family medicine appealed to me was the idea that I could build this relationship with my patients. And that wasn't letting me do that. So, you know, I had the typical 15 minutes, you come in, seven of those minutes was your MA taking vitals and verifying meds. And so then, you know, I'm at the computer and before you know it, I'm in and out and I, I just, I hated it. So when you were in residency though, what was your, Mm -hmm. well, I guess two questions. One, you were at Mm -hmm. Howard and you said, I want to become a family medicine physician. What did you think it was going to be like at that time or what pulled you into the field? So actually, it, I, I got to family medicine in a very roundabout way. I was going to do peds all my life. Huh. I wanted to be a pediatrician. Yes. So since I was a little, little, little girl, I wanted to be a pediatrician. Um, and then, you know, life comes at you fast. Um, so fourth year, I actually ended up getting pregnant with my son uh, in okay. September of my fourth year of med school. And... Um, you know, I made a decision that I wanted to just kind of accept what came along the way. And so my mentor at the time, who was Dr. Forrester, pediatrics. Oh, um, I think I heard that she just retired. Kind of, I thought I saw something oh, really? about her retiring. I yeah, did. I think love oh, I uh, they, posted something. Oh, man. Oh, man. She's phenomenal. But, um, you know, I remember coming to her and the same day that I found out I was pregnant, actually found out I had failed step two CK. Oh, God. So it was a a day of emotion. And so she was the one who was like, just one foot in front of the other. So fast forward throughout the year, I was due to deliver in June. I decided I'm going to take the year off because, you know, why would I start residency with a newborn? Turns out I actually, I had to retake step two CK, failed it a second time. Oh no. So then I ended up having to sit out a year. I finished all my clinicals, like everything else, but I couldn't actually graduate with the class. And so that was that was a humbling experience. So I ended up having to take a board review course, passed, and then right before I was going to enter the match, because I still had my ear ass was all rep- prepared for PEDS. And I spoke with a very good friend of mine and he said, Candace, I think that you're gonna be bored 
with pediatrics. And I'm like, what do you mean? I love kids. And he's like, yeah, but do you think you're going to be wanting to do well child checks every day for the next 30, 40 <laughs> years? And I was like, hmm, maybe not. And it, you know, going through all the different rotations, I loved OB, not enough to be an OB. I loved surgery, not enough to be a surgeon. Right. Um, you know, I loved ortho randomly. <laughs> I love sports medicine. And so I, you know, the idea of family medicine was like, huh, well, I could do maybe a little bit of all of that together. And, you know, kind of serves my ADHD too. Yeah. Um, so that was really what, so that was really what, um, you know, pointed me toward that. And I ended up um, in the scramble, which uh, it's called the soap now, but it was still yeah. the scramble when I did it. Um, so I ended up in a scramble and actually Dr. Forrester, mm -hmm. um, she called in a favor. Well, she called a friend of hers who was a program director out in Ohio and was like, hey, I've got this student. She's had some challenges, but, you know, she's ready to work. And I talked with the incoming chief resident who was another black woman, also a mommy. And boom, I had the spot and I was going to Ohio. So it was it. Like I said, there were it not for, you know, Howard and and yeah. the people behind me there, I, I wouldn't be where I am today. Oh, man, that is such a touching story. Thank you for sharing. And, and Dr. Forrester, she is a pediatrician at Howard. I don't know yes. how long she's been there. I saw her Forever. probably three years ago because I was just in town. I think I talked to some group. I went to her mm -hmm. office and she had the wall covered in cards and pictures of all of her yeah. former students she's at the just the best yeah. person so yeah she is the best yeah. person she's uh i think she yeah. may have retired recently because <laughs> love anani had a uh, post something mm -hmm. about that but that's the family that you get at howard yeah yeah definitely oh, gosh definitely. so you were in ohio for residency mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. was the practice like for family medicine there because you said you just went into full scope so what was was there any difference mm -hmm. or you were you know what you're getting into um so i went into what's called an unopposed program meaning that our residency program was the only residency that was actually housed in the hospital we were in hmm. so well us in podiatry but so there were so that and we had an open icu in an open okay. ER. So that means that we, as family medicine residents, we staffed the ICU, we staffed the ER, we staffed L&D. And then there was a bone and joint hospital. And before they started the sports medicine program, we were staffing with the sports medicine and the orthodox. Oh, wow. So I really, truly, and then in Columbus, um, Nationwide Children's Hospital is mm. there, which is one of the nation's like, you know, premier children's hospital. So that was where we did our PEDS rotations. So I really had the full spectrum exposure. I mean, I, I was scrubbed in on surgeries. I was scrubbed in on C-sections. I was, you know, I was managing the vents in the ICU. So I did a little bit of everything. So I, I really, you know, as hard as it was, I truly appreciate that experience and, you know, being able to come out. And I really came out feeling like, okay, I can pretty much tackle anything, anywhere, you know, within reason. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm still, I still wish I could deliver another baby, but <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's another conversation. So. Oh, gosh. So, and that that's fantastic. So you said opposed versus unopposed. So if you're, in, a, a, mm -hmm. so if you're in an opposed family medicine program, mm -hmm. then there might be like a general surgery residency or internal Correct. medicine. Mm -hmm. And so then you okay. would have to not fight it out, but you know, there wouldn't be as much exposure. There wouldn't be mm -hmm. as much opportunity. There were other residencies because um, my hospital was a part of a, a larger health system that did have other residencies. So for instance, the doctor's hospital had a neurosurgery program. And so their neurosurgery residents would come over to our hospital. They also had the OB program. And so their OB residents would um, staff our L&D, but it was along with us because we also mm -hmm. had our own um, uh, community L&D clinic. And then we had our own private OB patients that okay. we delivered. So it was, we were always, you know, there were no ER residents that came over. It was us. Yeah, there were no, you know, critical care that we had some critical care fellows, but we didn't have internal medicine residents there with us. So we were the ICU 
residents. So yeah. That's dope. So you yeah. left, you had a uh, fantastic training, very well-rounded, mm-hmm. which prepared you for mm-hmm. full, I think you said full, full spectrum family full medicine spectrum. practice mm-hmm. at, uh, at your first job. So aside from the money, mm-hmm. cause I think everybody, you, know, you start <laughs> that job, you get a lot more money and you're like, yo, this is great. Yeah. But after a couple of years, you start looking around and, and saying, mm, maybe not so, so great. Yeah. Well, what was your yeah. experience? Um, for me, it was, it took about a year and a half. And, you know, like I alluded to earlier, it, it just, it felt very much like assembly line medicine. And mm-hmm. I wasn't able to take the time with my patients that I really wanted to. And that was one of the things that one of the tenants that is like the cornerstone of family medicine is building relationships. Because you yeah. think of the old school family medicine doctors who literally took care mm-hmm. of the whole family for generations. And it was based on those relationships that they had. So, you know, that was that was really what I wanted. And I doing like working with the big health system and, and kind of seeing the volume that they wanted me to see in order to keep up with the numbers and keep the lights on. I, I wasn't able to, to do that. So, so what does that sound like? Wait, because people kind of describe it, but it's hard to see like that that push for production pressure because people aren't coming in the office yelling like C forty patients, right? Or I don't know, are they? Right. But how did how do you feel right. like pressure? Numbers, metrics. It was um, coming up in reviews. Like mm. you're not meeting these metrics. You're not meeting these numbers. You're not meeting these RVUs, and um, pretty standard. Uh, for especially for for primary care is your first year you're on a guarantee salary. Okay. So as you're ramping up and you know building your panel, you're on a guarantee. But after that, you're an RVU. So essentially, you can take a really big salary dip. But also, if you go beneath a certain amount, then they can put you on a um, on an improvement plan. They can put you on a PIP. Oh. Um, yeah. So if you're not meeting the numbers goal that the organization has set out and a lot of those, I mean, you know, I can't attribute all of the evil to the big um, healthcare organizations. A lot of it is set by insurance, Medicare, you know, if you accept Medicare patients, Medicare has all of these standards and guidelines that the health systems are held to and they're not always realistic and they're not, they're not patient centered the way that they promote them. So right. that's what it feels like. It's the pressure to meet these metrics and meet these benchmarks. And you have a dashboard when you log in every day and you see your numbers and you see where you are. And so, and that, hmm. that that's anxiety provoking when all yeah. I want to do is come to work and take good care of my patients. So. It, and, and that affects not, fam- not just family medicine, that affects orthopedic surgery Internal medicine is, you know, chances are whether you've looked at it or not, mm-hmm. there is a dashboard for whatever corporation mm-hmm. you practice for and you're probably doing mm-hmm. OK and nobody's going to bother you. But if you, you get caught slipping, you're going to have yeah. a conversation. It, it's happened to somebody mm-hmm. I know indirectly uh, recently, and it's probably a clause somewhere in your contract where, like you mentioned, they could, hey, we might have to let you go. Um, so it's just something to be aware of as, as you go out and practice. I was say that's something that we're not we're not really told in residency mm-hmm. as we're applying for our real life grown up jobs. That's not something that we're taught. So, <laughs> yeah. So, how long did you uh, practice in that model? <sighs> Maybe 16 months. Okay. <laughs> I think that's about as long as I lasted. Yeah. So, I mean, there were other things, but it was a lot. It it really it really was a lot, and I just I wasn't I wasn't happy, and I didn't feel like it was sustainable for me. Yeah. I couldn't see myself practicing like that. One of the other docs in the practice, she had been, they had actually bought her practice, but she had been there mm. for like twenty five plus something like that years, and I. I I just, I couldn't see that for myself. So, wow. Yeah. And, so and I, I, I love that because there is that sunken cost fallacy where you're, you're like, I've put so much time into it. I can just gut it out. I can make it. But as some, sometimes you just got to 
walk away. So you said 16, 16 yeah. months ish. And then what did you yeah, pivot roughly. to? Um, so I, through some contacts, um, relationships that I had built, I found out about a company that did house calls and I said, huh, okay. house calls, what people do that. And sure enough. Yeah. So I did that for about four years where I did house calls on mainly, you know, homebound patients. So mainly geriatric. So that was kind of my first foray into geriatric care. Okay. And I, I really loved it. Um, part of that time also, I served as a hospice medical director, um, mm. which when I tell people that they're like, Oh my gosh, you did hospice. And, and yes, it, yes, it's, it's what you think, but <laughs> I learned so (laughs) much and I feel like it made me, I mean, that portion made me, I I think it made me a better doctor, honestly. Yeah. So that, but that was, it was getting to practice. Like I wanted to practice. I'd go to people's houses. I mean, I had patients who would make food for me and, you know, they'd give me like, I had, I literally had a patient out in rural Suffolk who had chickens and she would give me fresh eggs. Every time I came, it's you better find them now with the price of eggs. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right. I wish I could find her in 2023. But no, and that was, you know, I got to know the family, the dog, everything, you know. Wow. So it was um, it was that was that was really good. But then there were some management transitions and some administrative things that kind of made it not a great environment to work in anymore. So um, I really actually, and I, I was sad when I had to leave the hospice company because like I said, I really loved it. You know, for me, I felt like that was a ministry because, you know, how you help people cope with the end of life, no matter what your beliefs are, no matter what the differences in your beliefs are. I mean, it's something that we will all have to contend with and, yeah the, you know, being able to provide the support and just sometimes a hand to hold, you know, being able to help people not have to watch their loved ones suffer. That was, you know, that was very important to me. So that was a, that was a really, a really good time in my career. And, you know, hopefully I might be able to do that again one day. Yeah. You were talking yeah. earlier, so you, you mentioned you've transitioned now into uh, working with skilled nursing facilities. So can you kind of mm-hmm. describe uh, what that is? How did you get into this? Sure. Um, so basically, I, I pretty much decided I, I didn't want to be employed anymore. So mm-hmm. I didn't want to have somebody throwing metrics in my face all the time and have all these numbers and goals to meet. And so I said, okay, well, what can I do? So I was going to do locums for a little bit. And then I came across this opportunity for a medical director position in a skilled nursing facility. So after talking with the recruiter, you know, talking with the other docs, I had a a friend of mine who I'd worked with previously at the the house call practice, and she had uh, transitioned into this role as well. And, you know, she spoke very highly of it. So I said, okay, I'm already very comfortable with this population because it's mainly geriatric, you know, high levels of disability. So, okay, I'll get into it. Um, And so I'm working as an independent contractor. So I'm not employed. Um, I have an LLC. And so I contract with the company um, to provide my medical director services. So so that's how I kind of got into it. Yeah. Um, nice. skilled, skilled nursing facility, what most people identify colloquially as a nursing home, um, but there's multiple levels of care. So um, there's post-acute care, which is, you know, when patients come out of the hospital, they've been hospitalized for surgery or for <clears throat> a severe illness or, you know, something to that nature. And they need a short term stay with skilled nursing care, whether it be for IV antibiotics or wound care. Um, And then they also need some level of therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. So that's post-acute care. Um, Usually those patients stay anywhere for a couple of weeks, maybe a month, depends. Mm -hmm. Then there's long-term care. And that's, that's kind of the area that most people are familiar with when they think of nursing home care. These are patients who are not able to care for themselves at home. 
due to any number of disabilities, whether it be a physical limitation, um, dementia, some kind of um, a psychiatric diagnosis that renders them inability to care, uh, unable to care for themselves. So they're with us, you know, long term, as it uh, says in the name. Um, and there's long term acute care. And so then, or LTAC. Uh, so those are the long term patients who need a skilled nurse, um, who need skilled nursing care for like ventilators. If they have a trach, they're on a vent, they have a peg. So they need more intensive nursing care, but it will be for the rest of their life. So there's three different. Those are the those are the different that's levels. Fascinating, because working in the ICU this year during fellowship, I mm-hmm. have launched countless folks into short term, yes. long term LTAC, and I don't know yes. what happens after they get there. <laughs> yes, I've been curious a couple yes. times, but how? So, so who decides? Like, okay, you're ready to graduate from short term, and you're going to mm-hmm. go into long term. Like, like, who? Who is that? That's you. Did you decide to? Um, it is a combination. So I will say, unfortunately, a lot of times it's the insurance that Mm. determines when they're going to stop paying for skilled services. Um, yeah. uh Uh-huh. And then it depends on how well they've progressed with therapy, whether they have a safe place to discharge to or not, whether there's, you know, family that can take care of them or if they can afford to, have a private caregiver at home if that's what they need. So that a lot of times will determine whether or not they transition to long-term care. And what a lot of people don't know is when you transition over to long-term care, whatever your, if it's Medicare that's paying for your short-term, they cut it off. So you either have to pay out of pocket or you have to apply for Medicaid. Lord. So, mm-hmm. Oh my God. So- mm-hmm. Because you, so, you'd mentioned the importance of advanced care planning. So I guess this is part of it. Yes. So yes. if you're on medic, so you need to apply to Medicare, like how long does that take and where do you stay in the meanwhile? So uh, that's a great question that we ask every day. So we, so if you say, for instance, you have a patient who, you know, is an elderly patient, maybe they had a hip fracture, they fell, fractured their hip, had a repair, or maybe they couldn't have a surgical repair. So now they've gone to skilled care. So they have plateaued. They've maxed out with their physical therapy. Um, As far as what insurance dictates, they need for therapy. They may still need assistance, but they don't need a skilled therapist helping them Mm -hmm. every day. So then comes the question, okay, can this person go home? Is there support at home? Can I just order them home health? So then if the question is, what if grandma lived by herself, family is 300 miles away, what do we do now? So then um, oftentimes families will appeal. So there's a whole appeals process um, once the insurance issues a notice of termination. So they can appeal. Insurance says you (laughs) you got to leave. Basically, and they they give us 48 hours. That's Oh, my God. They give us 48 hours and I don't want to sound like I'm bashing the system, but I mean, it really, it's a broken system because these are the most frail, (laughs) most vulnerable, you know, patients. So they give us 48 hours. That that feeds you. I I know, but so, you know, so they give us 48 hours and so often the families will appeal. And then in that process, um, usually the social worker will have spoken with the families about, okay, what is your next step for care for your loved one? And then it becomes, okay, well, let's submit a Medicaid application, but Medicaid, you know, is income-based. And so then there comes the question of assets and do they need to do mm. a spin down? It becomes a very, so you, you said it can a become spend, a very murky spend down. Spend down. So yes. So if a patient has too many liquid assets, essentially, then they either have right. So there has to be a spend down. Basically, they have to get rid of that. Either they have to turn oh, it, write no. it over to the facility, or what? they yes. It, it's it's a yes. Candace, you robbing yeah, people. These, I, <laughs> no, it is, I wish I got that money. I wish. <laughs> oh no. I wish. No, but yeah, yeah. It, it it's a um 
it, it becomes a very murky process because then, especially when you're dealing with elderly patients, you're you're dealing with the you know power of attorney and mm-hmm. who can access what and and then also they advance care planning. So all of those things kind of start to to work together and it, it can become a very convoluted and frustrating process for us as the docs and the families. And so, yeah. you know, a lot of times it doesn't, it feels like we're on, we're on opposing sides and we're not, we're, we, we both want the same thing. Right. And, and, you know, I think it's, it's crazy thinking about it. And I learned so much for talking to you because I have sent so many people out and I don't see them until they bounce back. I'm like, man, why they send, you know, Mr. Smith back. But I don't know what mm-hmm. it's like on your your side. Yeah, so that's one of the things that um, we are, I guess, graded on is a rehospitalization rate. And so for us, if we get a patient, our goal is to not have to send them back to the hospital. Hmm. And so especially for things like sepsis, uh, pneumonia, and usually the sepsis is from either pneumonia or UTI hands down or a wound that's infected. And so those are things that we're measured on. Um, Hmm. It is how well did you try to manage this? Were you able to catch this before? Was the patient having UTI symptoms and you didn't treat them with the, with an antibiotic soon enough? So there's a bit of hypervigilance when it comes to, when it comes to that, because that reflects on us and our quality of care. Are we sending patients right back, especially if it's, for the same thing that they came to us for or something that is uh, deemed preventable, like an infection. So, so yeah, as much as you don't want to see them come back, we don't want to send them back. Oh, okay. Yeah. So y'all are trying. So, so I wonder how, I mean, so a lot of patients, you figure it out. They got a UTI, I'm going to treat it. And then Mm -hmm. they never, Mm -hmm. we don't see them again. I mean, in the hospital. That is the goal. No, that's the goal. Absolutely. And then sometimes patients find a new way. (laughs) A new way to make it back to the hospital. And you're like, well, all right, I guess I got to send you. I mean, (laughs) sure, your hemoglobin (laughs) sticks. Okay, fine. I'll send you to the hospital. (laughs) Let me recheck it first. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. No, that is so helpful. Thank you for providing this insight into this world. Because I know we all, like at some point in medicine, you have discharged somebody to to somewhere. You've discharged to a yes. sniff or an LTAC. So learning, I mean, that perspective is is invaluable. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. <laughs> so that's what happens when you discharge your ICU. So, so okay. To me. Oh gosh. All right. I'm gonna keep them all in the hospital from, from now on. Nobody's getting discharged. So so how do I avoid my parent, my love, my great aunt, uncle? Mm-hmm. from getting kicked out in 24 like that's crazy what what can you do to fix this so some of it is just honestly it's just how the system is i i can't even i can't sugarcoat it some of it is if if the government if medicare is paying for their stay then they have to meet certain criteria in order to continue with their skilled services but What I run into so frequently in talking with families is that they knew that mom, grandma, you know, auntie, whoever, they knew that they were declining months Mm -hmm. ago, months before they had that fall, before they got that UTI that sent them to the hospital and now to skilled care. And they did not have a conversation at that time when they okay. recognized, okay, things are taking a turn. And so then this all comes up and it feels very much like a surprise and it feels very urgent when planning, advanced planning could direct some of this care. You know, even if they're, you know, even if it says, okay, well, we're going to put away a certain amount of money a month just in case, you know, we see that, that grandma, she's not getting around so well right now. Can we set aside some money if possible for her if she has to go to um, skilled care or long-term care? Um, you know, do, do we know what her end of life wishes are? 
Does mm-hmm. she want to be put on a ventilator and then end up in an LTAC? Those types of conversations and questions there to be had, not when the patient is acutely ill in the hospital, but way before. Yeah. And uh, like insurance, because if they had good insurance, then they would get covered, right? Mm, not always. <laughs> not always. Oh, gosh. Um, very few. We have some private pay patients. Sometimes that can be just as dicey because, I mean, let's, you know, let's be real. Insurance is for profit. And so they're going to do make decisions that are in that's in the best interest of their shareholders and you know their bottom line their profit margin not necessarily the interest of the patients and that's my experience so <laughs> hopefully I don't sound too disgruntled but I don't want people to think that oh if I just had better insurance you know I would get better care that's usually not the case because I'll tell you, as the doctor who's actually rendering the care, I don't know what insurance you have. I just know you're mm-hmm. here. I don't know yeah. until they tell me, Dr. Hughes, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Jones, she got to go. And to the insurance said, we're cutting her Blue off. Cross, you can do her Blue discharge Shield, today. Medicare, Medicaid. Humana, whoever <laughs> says she, she got to go. go. You need to do her discharge. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when I find <laughs> out. I, I'm just, oh, I my know. God. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. Well, let's let. I don't know if it's happier, but what, what's a typical day like for you as a okay. <laughs> working with these? A good a day you're not kicking I, somebody out. I don't know. All right, right, right no. <laughs> um, so one of the great things about this position and being contracted is that I don't have to adhere to a schedule. I don't have to report at a certain time, um, which works for me as a working mom because I'm able to take my son to school in the morning. Okay, and then I kind of. I usually get to my first facility um, somewhere around 9.30. Um, Usually I will grab the the, um, census list. I'll run a report seeing if there were any admissions since my last visit. And then I will make my rounds. My rounds usually consist of going to the nurse's station, talking with the charge nurse, kind of getting the report, overnight report, similar to how we do in the hospital. You know, finding yeah. out what happened overnight or what happened since the last time I was here. Um, and then I go see my patients and um, usually I'll confer with the DON at some point, uh, the administrator, and then try to do my charting as best as I can without, you know, depending on how many interruptions I get. Hey, Dr. Hughes, can you come see this patient really quickly? Um, so that, you know. That can get to be a bit much. Uh, Part of my duties, though, as medical director, I have a team that works with me. So I I actually oversee um, PAs and MPs. And at one of my busier facilities, I have another doc who works with me. So Mm -hmm. I have to. So we do recertifications for patients who have been admitted um, for 30, 60, 90 days. We have to recertify at certain intervals that the patient still requires this level of care. So that's part of it. Um, I have to sit in on quality improvement meetings uh, called COAPIs. Um, So basically, if there's something in the clinical process that is not ideal, if we've had a negative outcome, we have to develop a plan to improve that. And so I have to be part of that. I sit in on that, help to develop those plans. So I also do things like medication reviews. So always trying to be a good steward of antibiotics, antipsychotics, uh, and narcotic medications. So those are constantly under review. I'm always reviewing those for the patients. So it's pretty busy. So usually I'll do that at one facility, take a quick lunch break, and then go to another facility and do the same thing all over again. Awesome. Well, it sounds like a, a good amount of variety, which... For me, I mean, mm-hmm. burnout, I, I firmly believe burnout is caused by doing the same exact thing over and over again. Yes. Um, so yes. it seems like you found something that works for you, has some freedom. Yeah, the flexibility is good. Definitely. I can, you know, I can make doctor's appointments if I need to. Um, I don't necessarily have to ask permission to take a day off, to take time off. I just kind of have to notify and say, hey, can you cover this day for me? So that's kind of nice. 
And then, like you said, no two days are alike. So I think today is Tuesday. Yesterday, I got to the one facility in the morning, had to send one patient out to the ER because he was he wasn't doing well with a sugar of 33. And mm-hmm. then another patient I had to do a you full some apple juice. med review. Uh, you know, a little bit, a little bit, maybe <laughs> a little Narcan too, but anyway. Um, so, you know, and then another patient I had to do a full med review because the hospital sent us the wrong discharge medicine list. So there's, oh, I kind of never know what I'm walking into. Yeah. And it's, it's never the same, which is fine. Because like you said, it, it, it keeps me from getting bored. It keeps the grass from growing under my feet. Awesome. Well, Dr. Hughes, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing your pathway. Like pretty much everybody I talk to, none none of our pathways are the same. As as competent and confident and successful as we appear, there are some bumps that we (laughs) encountered in the road and we've managed to get by them. So you will too. It is match week for 2023 so we got all of the like the young uh physicians matching and then you know scrambling to get positions and so i just want to encourage you all as you guys start your careers people that are in residency in practice that if whatever you're doing isn't working look for something that that does that does work dr hughes is a definitely shining example of that definitely Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I, I hope I didn't bore the listeners. I mean, this is not the, it's not the fanciest. It's not the the sexiest part of medicine, but it is an important part because again, mm-hmm. we're all going to reach this at some point in some way. So, you know, got to talk about it. Yeah, I certainly learned a lot. Thank you so much for coming <laughs> on the show, Dr. Hughes, my fellow Howard alum, uh, HU. Absolutely. You know. And uh, thanks for listening to the Black Doctors podcast. We're here because representation matters.